Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Per usual, the weeks get crazier. Each succeeding week is crazier than the preceding one. It's a cumulative effect. It's never going to stop as long as Donald Trump is president. With the election coming up, it's getting even crazier. Uh, It's going to get very, very crazy. Uh, There's just so much going on. And I'm going to make an observation at the beginning. We know. I know, you know, and if you don't know, you should know. Donald Trump's the worst president we ever had. The man's incompetent, immoral, evil, a psychopath. He's ruining our country. And those of you who don't believe it better start believing it because we're going down the tubes. Uh, The Democrats have to win the next election big. They have to elect a a Democratic Senate. Or, my friends, we have had it as a nation. It will never, never be the same again. Uh, Be that as it may, let me tell you where we're going tonight. We're going to go to Wilmington, Delaware, Washington, D.C., New York City, Hollywood, Florida, Venezuela, New Zealand, Berlin, London, and China. What a trip. Let's hope we get it all in. I want to start with the post office tonight. It was announced today that the post office is suspending all the crazy rules and and changes they said they were going to put into effect, uh, the postmaster, Louis DeJoy, uh, obviously got to be a Trump, uh, you know, he sucks up to Trump, must be, he did what Trump wanted, now he has to back off, he's a rich businessman, he doesn't belong in Washington, he doesn't belong in politics, uh, this guy's probably sorry he ever took the job right now, it was, what has it been, two weeks when, uh, as postmaster, Trump had him announced, that they were taking the mailboxes away, some mailboxes away, a lot of mailboxes away. Can you imagine taking mailboxes off of corners? And they were taking machines, machines uh, that that rapidly, rapidly sorted mail. Millions of pieces a day were being removed, have already been removed. And what worries me, I read this morning somewhere that some of these machines have already been destroyed and their parts disposed of. Donald Trump authoring all these actions, of course. Now, be that as it may, uh, it was announced today, they won't buy the joy that the... Uh, The equipment will not be removed, and overtime will not be cut or any hours cut until none of this will happen until after the election. Everything is on hold until after the election, okay? Uh, Now, this bothers me, okay? Uh, Very much bothers me because you can't trust Donald Trump. I mean, this guy gets into things, out of things, screws up the country for a week or two, then walks away. It seems to be happening here. But I'm worried what happens at the last minute, okay? Election day is November 3rd. What happens a week before? What happens four days before? Uh, Trump says we're going to do this, and boom, something happens that's going to make not all of the mail-in or and absentee ballots counted. Uh, so when the judge testifies before the Senate on Friday, when he testifies before the House next week, and whatever He says he's going to do. It has to be in writing and signed. You know, it's like Reagan with the Russians. Trust but verify. you got to tie Trump up that he can't do anything at the last minute that would affect the result of the election or give him the opportunity to say the election was rigged, it's not valid, it's no good. Uh, Okay? Because that's the way he normally works which now brings me to the democratic convention last night i thought it was terrific uh i like it better than a regular convention at the regular convention the speakers sometimes were hard to hear only about 20 percent of the people sitting out there in the convention center would would be listening the rest the rest are having a good time bullshitting running around uh it's party time uh, the, what, 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 of what value are the delegates but to be there 
I, that the presidency has already been decided, okay? Who's going to be their nominee? So it's a good time, but you can't hear. And the reporters, they're trying to ask questions of people. And they're crowded, and you can't hear them. I liked last night. It was organized, and I'm sure the Republican convention will be the same way. I will be shocked if it is not. And you could hear what everyone had to say. And I want to make some observations, my feelings about last night. First of all, I thought the opening, the first 45 minutes, were outstanding. I I, I, I was happy. <laughs> uh, I've got to tell you, I was proud to be an American. Uh, not a Democrat, because the first 45 minutes were, in effect, pride regarding being American and American. And I was happy about it all. I had a happy feeling at the end of 45 minutes. And, and uh, how did this whole thing start now? They had children, kids. Many of them, their pictures all over the Internet, little pictures. So you had maybe 50 pictures of kids on at one time. And they started off by singing the national anthem. And they were all dressed in red, white, and blue. Children of all ethnic backgrounds, all colors, dressed in red, white, and blue and singing the national anthem. What can be more moving, okay? Okay. So it was a great first 45 minutes. Let me tell you, let me share with you my thoughts regarding some of the speakers. John Kasich, Kasich, uh, I have liked him from the time years ago he was in Congress. He became chairman of the uh, one of the committees um, having to do with money, of a mental block as to what they called it. Uh, he, fin- uh, he finally became chairman of that committee. He was outstanding. He's a conservative, can't deny it, but he's not a crazy conservative. Uh, And he did a hell of a job, and I used to say back then, that was 20 years ago, he would make a good president. Then he became governor of Ohio. Uh, Didn't hear anything bad about him, Uh, nothing particularly favorable about him, so I assume he was a decent governor. Uh, He showed where his fortitude is, where his beliefs are, uh, in 2016, before Trump was even the designated the Republican nominee, before he had won the primary, John Kasich came out and said, Trump's no good in effect. I can't support him. I would not support him. He's a bad man. Okay, And he's stuck by that <laughs> in, in the four years that Trump has been president now. Uh, he hasn't backed off, and it makes it doesn't surprise me that he, a big Republican, spoke at the Democratic Convention last night. Uh, he isn't being a two-faced. He's, and because there's so many major Republicans in this country that are openly on TV every day saying, I was a Republican, now I'm an independent. Most of them didn't turn Democratic. I think Kasich is still a Republican. But he said something very profound, and I quote, America is at a crossroads. What could be truer? We are at a crossroads. If this guy's reelected, we're in deep shit trouble, excuse the way I put it. If he's not, this country can be saved and will be saved. We need a a Democratic Senate, too, and I think we will get it if Biden is elected. Now, Michelle Obama. How many times today have I heard America's favorite woman, Um, The woman most loved in America, and it's true. My God, this woman is outstanding. She'd make a terrific president. Uh, Wow. And she came across last night as expected because she now has a reputation for being very articulate, very intelligent, et cetera, et cetera. She had to be a major crutch for Barack during their marriage. Uh, you know, their pillow talk at night when they went, when they went to bed, when it concerned uh, uh, what was going on in the world and the pressures and decisions that Barack Obama had to make, I'm sure he shared his thoughts with his wife, and she had to be a good influence on him in helping him to arrive at what was an appropriate decision. She said about Trump last night, and I quote, she nailed Trump all over the place last night. He, and I quote, here we go. He has had more than enough time to prove that, that he can do this job, but he is clearly in over his head. 
He cannot meet this moment. He cannot meet this moment, unquote. Very good. Uh, this woman's outstanding, absolutely outstanding. And her words were brilliant last night. Then there was uh, a woman we didn't see, a young lady, I don't know, 30 years old, maybe late 20s, 30s, maybe early 30s, uh, hard to tell. Her name's Kristen Urquiza, U-R-Q-U-I-Z-A, Urquiza. Uh, I've seen her on television several times today already. I saw her last night during the convention. And here's what she had to say. She's not a politician, but something happened and this is in her family, and this is what she had to say. Her father, and there's a picture of her father and her and her mother on TV, uh, her father believed Trump was a good person and supported Trump and voted for Trump, okay? He died of coronavirus in the, in the past year. And his daughter, Kristen, said, and I quote, his only pre-existing condition was trusting Donald Trump. And for that, he paid with his life. Not bad. And she's going to be there again. You're going to see a lot of her on television. Moving on to the New York Times columnist, Frank Bruni, uh, in an opinion piece today in the New York Times, uh, he said the following, and I quote, This isn't a time for business as usual. It isn't a usual time. Never in my 55 years have the Democrats' success mattered more for the welfare, the sanity, the future of these United States than now, because never has the fork in the road been a Republican president as profoundly amoral, fundamentally corrupt, flatly incompetent as the one seeking four more years, says it. Camilla Harris, uh, I think this woman, is woman, lady, she's going to be outstanding as a vice president. I, I'm impressed already that everything Trump says, she takes him on right away. She doesn't care. Uh, he has more than met his match, I think, in this lady. Uh, and my sense is, I think she's, she's about 50, uh, my sense is that she represents the future because she's Asian, she's black, she is a woman, uh, well-educated, okay? Uh, she seems to speak for everybody, of everyone of every race. And I see her, and I think many people do, as the future. It won't be government as it has been for the last 50 years. I'm not saying government for the last 50 years has been bad. It has been bad in the last four years. But we're in a period of transition, a time of change. Uh, these protests show it. They're young kids, many of them, and they want to be heard. The, the elections that gave the House control to the Democrats in 2018 showed that we're moving into a new generation. We're moving into the future. And I think Kamala Harris is the future. And at the same time that I think she is the future, I think Mike Pence is history in more ways than one. I want to talk about a great movie star. Uh, some of you may recall her, some of you may not. Age may have something to do with it. Her name is Audrey Hepburn. Audrey Hepburn. Uh, great Academy Award winner a couple of times, dead now. Uh, she, um, very few people are aware of the, the time she spent during World War II. She lived in Belgium and the Netherlands. She was a young girl in Belgium and the Netherlands, a teenager. Belgium and the Netherlands when they were under Nazi control. And I've read about this several times over the years. She hungered. She starved. There wasn't enough food. At some point, somehow, she got to England where there was enough food. But for a couple of years, she said, I was hungry all the time. There wasn't enough food under the Nazis. Now, she, to refresh your recollection, if you may not recall her, she made great movies, but I'll, uh, let me mention a few of them. My Fair Lady, 
How's that? Great movie. She starred in it with Rex Harrison. Then there was Breakfast at Tiffany's with George Papard. Roman Holiday with Gregory Peck. And Sabrina with Humphrey Bogart and William Holden. Great movies. Great acting. And she was always the young, even when she got older, the young appearing girl with a sweet face and would never utter a bad word to anyone at any time while she was acting. Uh, I came across a, I'm getting into her tonight, because I came across a comment uh, by her in my readings this morning, and it was this, and I quote, I was born with an enormous need for affection. I repeat, I was born with an enormous need for affection and a terrible need to give it. And from the readings I've had about her life, all right, she people loved her. She needed love in her life big time. And she also shared her feeling for love with others. God rest her soul. Tiger Woods, big day this weekend. All right. Yeah, Tiger Woods has an 11-year-old son named Charlie. All right. Charlie this weekend won a junior golf tournament held in Palm City, Florida. Hey, all right, a junior golf tournament. His dad caddied with him uh, for part of the way. I've got to say this before I tell you what this kid did that was terrific, like father, like son, okay? The apple does not fall far from the tree, no question about it. All right, he was... He played, Charlie played in the 11-H category. It was a nine-hole tournament. He came in first. That's not important. He shot 33, three under par. He had three birdies in that score. That's wild, okay? And this was competitive. Let me tell you, these kids that are going to come up today are going to be better than the young people, the people in their 20s that are playing golf today professionally. The the young men that are playing today professionally are better than than Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus, and everyone else back then. They're just a different brand of golf. And these kids are going to be even better. 11 years old, shoots 33. The fellow, the young boy who came in second wasn't that far off. He shot 38. He was only off by five strokes. What well, great golfers were making. But the, the point of this story is Tiger Woods won. His father used to go to the tournaments with him. This father, Tiger Woods, had to be most proud. And I'm sure his coach, Tiger Woods, was proud also. This is my son, and I'm helping him to learn. Okay. Bread riots. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're going to go into starvation if things continue as they are in this country. Coronavirus, no jobs, no trucking, uh, food can't be grown, people aren't going to have money. The more people that are out of work, (laughs) the more people won't have enough money to buy food, so the stores can't stay open, they have nothing to sell, the farmers can't grow, the meat packing houses can't cut up the meat, because who the hell is going to pay them? Who's going to buy it? There's no money. And this is all occurring under Donald Trump. Uh, first, coronavirus, which he didn't take control of, and also, also here, the fact that he has these problems, and they involve money, and we are, he has not yet approved a second stimulus package. The people have lost that extra $600 a week who need that $600 a week. Uh, and they've got families to support. It, it just, and the money is, they're not sending the money out. And now we're going into September, the whole month of August, no money. Uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans took the month off. It's vacation time, though the Democrats are coming back early uh, to take on the post office situation. Uh, It's uh, it's ridiculous, though. And the feeling is that in several months before the end of the year, we may we already have large lines waiting to get free food. Uh, It's going to be worse and there won't be enough food to go around. And I don't know what's going to happen. 
I, I can tell you what's going to happen. And this is going to happen if we elect Donald Trump again without any question in my mind. Uh, recall Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. Now, you know, it was all about the French Revolution, 1789. Legend, legend has it that Queen Marie Antoinette, when told the poor did not have any bread, she responded, let them eat cake, because cake was cheaper then. Today, it would be Trump saying, let them eat bread, if, you, if the bakeries are making bread. Uh, the point was, she did not care, okay? And what happened was a revolt, and she lost her head. Now, if Donald gets reelected, God forbid, <laughs> and this food shortage comes, which even the experts say are go is going to come, uh, Donald won't lose his head, I don't think. But let me tell you, the storm, the door, the steps of the White House will be stormed if things get that bad, because Trump does not care about people. All right, he does not care about people, uh, and it would be just like him, typical of Marie Antoinette, to say, "Let uh, me cake." Okay, uh, so you don't want this to happen. You don't want Trump to continue. Uh, in office, you've got to vote for Joe Biden to save this country. Now, several years ago, I don't know when I wrote this thing, I think back in 2016 before the election, uh, I wrote an article for Conk Life. It wasn't part of my blog, but it was an article for Conk Life. And I talked about what was happening in Venezuela. The people were starving. Recall, if you will, Trump has recently said, he wanted to go, remember a couple of months ago, he, he's got to invade Venezuela. The people are starving. He wanted to help them. He sent United States troops to the border of Chile and Venezuela. And when he did, he, he was full of shit. He didn't, he didn't want to help the people. He wanted the oil. The, <laughs> Venezuela has the third largest supply of oil reserves in the world. Out in the water, there's oil underneath that water. Big time. Well, so does Russia want that oil, and so does China. As soon as Trump sent American troops to the border of Chile and Venezuela, Putin had Russian troops fly into Venezuela, land at Venezuelan airports, because he and Maduro are friends, and all of a sudden we had a confrontation that never came to be. You never heard about our, our soldiers in Chile again. Trump pulled them back right away. But let me tell you quickly what happened in Venezuela. It hurts, all right? Uh, the first inkling of the problem, that they had a problem with food, was in 2013 after Maduro had been president for less than a year. Venezuela, the first thing they ran out of was toilet paper. Now, once a person is without something, the realization it's home, such as toilet paper, that toilet paper is a necessity of life. And today... Four years later, no, six years later, there is still a shortage of toilet paper in Venezuela. The store shelves had less and less food uh, because the farmers couldn't, the people couldn't pay the stores, the supermarkets for the food. The supermarkets couldn't pay the farmers because they didn't have a cash flow. And the farmers stopped growing food. Nobody was doing anything with regard to food, and the food shortages were acute in 2014, 28%. In 2015, 75% food shortages, all right? I don't know what the percentages are today, but it's wild. Famine moved in. Madero declared a national food crisis. Uh, the New York Times described the situation as Venezuela's convulsing from hunger. Okay, 2016 became the year even water was in poor supply. Now, we're going to have a water problem here. We've already had it for the last couple of years in California. We just don't publicize these things. Inflation exceeded. In November 2016, inflation in Venezuela exceeded 700%. There was no work. The factories couldn't operate. There was no electricity. Uh, and, and so on. Now, let's come to food. Families need food. And because they had no food, people were forced to extreme measures. Garbage was the first source of sustenance, okay? But garbage pails only held so much in food products that only lasted so long when everybody searched in the garbage pails. And a point was reached where there was no garbage. 
People had left nothing because they ate everything. Now, stealing a neighbor's food came next, but there was only so much food to steal. Your neighbor didn't have that much food. And then worse things came. Home pets, generally cats and dogs, were killed and eaten by families. And if they didn't have a pet, then they went out and stole somebody's pet, okay? And then the pets were no longer in supply. Next were the zoos. And they first, the chickens and rabbits and the like were stolen and eaten. Then larger zoo animals. In 2016, when things were bad, and they still are, a Caracas Zoo was broken into in the middle of the night. A black stallion was one of the zoo's featured animals. When zoo staff arrived in the morning, all that was left of the horse was its head and ribs. Well... What next? Hunger goes on. And babies and young children, young children were saying to mommy, I'm hungry. Family started eating only every second day, and that's what they do in Venezuela even today. Some only uh, every third day. They've trained themselves. Children are malnourished. They faint in class. Some die. Their bodies swell, and other bodies are nothing but skin and bones. Hands swell, Skin, skin, skin sticks to bones, belly swollen. Uh, mothers try to make babies sleep till noon to avoid a breakfast of non-existent milk or food. It's some kind of flour they mix together to give babies. They eat whatever they can. Uh, there's a black market for food, but only the generals and Maduro and a handful of affluent people can afford it. Uh, there's no meat. Uh, it's just terrible. Uh, it would cost a family of five for bare necessities today in Venezuela, $226. Doesn't sound like much money. But if nobody's working and there is no work <laughs> and the average salary of a family is $15 a month, how can they afford $226 a month? And the hospitals are the same way, et cetera, et cetera. This is what's going to happen here if we don't straighten ourselves out. I'm serious. We're going to, we already have a food problem. They're going to get worse. Too many people out of work. We, not enough federal uh, intrusion of dollars. Uh, too slow in coming when they do come. And we're going to have a food problem like we've never had in this country before. Don't re-elect Donald Trump. Which now brings me to what's important to Donald Trump. Do you know what's not important to him? His hair. He has been complaining that the water coming out of the the shower head, okay, comes out too slow. He's been complaining for, since he got elected. And it comes out of the taps on the sink too slow and so forth. And this occurred during Obama's administration. The EPA cut back on the force of the water, which means the amount of water coming through a shower head was less than normal, to save water because we were having water problems. California was having an extreme water problem at the time. Well, Trump says he wants perfect hair. And he recently he said, and I quote, my hair, I don't know about you, but it has to be perfect. Well, he finally got his way. The EPA has put out new regulations to remove the restrictions on water flow from a shower tap. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Because, and this is because of Donald Trump. He wants his hair to look perfect, and he doesn't want to spend forever in the shower washing his hair. And, you know, this is a shame. I have so much more to talk about tonight. Oh, my God. And my time is running out. Uh, But that's the way it is. I have more fodder for next week to share with you. Uh, Pay attention to what's going on. I don't have to preach. I am worried. We cannot reelect Donald Trump. We can't even make the election close. This guy, if this guy ever contests the election, it'll take years before we know what the hell's going on. It's not the American way. It's not the normal way. I enjoyed being with you tonight. I'm glad you joined me again. As I say every week, I watch this. My numbers keep going up. I love this. So I thank you again for joining me, and I look forward to being with you next week again. Good night.